and we are live streaming, which is something that we will be talking about in short order, among other technologies. Hi, I am Shell Holtz, uh, IABC fellow. I am director of internal communications at Webcore in, in uh, San Francisco. And I am joined today by four esteemed IABC fellows for a conversation on hot new communication technologies. Uh, we will be discussing specific technologies and some of the issues around implementing and deploying technologies. And uh, we will also be taking your questions in real time. There's two ways to do that. One is right there within YouTube, where I presume you're watching this because it's the only place we're streaming it to. Uh, you can use that live chat feature. The other is on Twitter. Just be sure to use that uh, hashtag COF63 because this is Circle of Fellows number 63. But we're looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, and uh, with that out of the way, let's meet the panel. I'll ask you each to give an introduction of yourself, starting with Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Gayeski. I'm a professor of strategic communications at Ithaca College. I uh, just stepped down recently from the deanship there. And uh, I practice what I preach through my firm, Gayeski Analytics. Thank you, Diane. It's great to have you here. Uh, Stacy, you're up next. Stacy Wilson. I am president of Elicor Consulting. We focus on strictly internal consulting with a very heavy emphasis in technology, uh, particularly digital workplace, uh, content, governance, strategy, those sorts of things. Great. And Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Hills um, from Chicago. And I am a co-principal in Hyman Hills Marketing Group. And I also teach out of Loyola University, Chicago's um, Global Strategic Communication Program. So um, a little of, of both worlds for me. And um, I think what um, Hyman Hills has been a part of for the last four years is conducting the Communicating AI Survey um, that is then released through the Center for Strategic Communication Excellence. So we do have some interesting results on, uh, from the spring of who is adopting uh, technology and, and how they're going about doing that. Great. And we will definitely be talking about AI. So looking to, uh, forward to hearing some of those results, Mary. Uh, and finally, Brad. Hi, Brad Whitworth, ABC STMP and an IABC fellow coming your way from Windsor, California. Um, I have a uh, long history of having worked at tech organizations and brought you some wonderful things from places like HP and Cisco, Hitachi, uh, Microfocus, PeopleSoft, so can talk from both at the buyer side and then that early adopter slash user side of things. And um, for sort of full disclosure, I'm doing work as a strategic services consultant for a crowd called Smart out of Helsinki, Finland. So um, I may watch myself into what it is that I say, but I will try not to make this anything like a commercial plug for Smart. Great. And yeah, you've noticed that we don't have anybody here from Facebook or Google <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Uh, the main one being we don't have any fellows from those organizations. Uh, but there's a long list of technologies that have not yet been adopted by most communicators. Uh, the one I just started to put together here um, on the fly before we started include blockchain, live streaming, virtual and augmented reality, uh, bots and digital assistants, computer vision, voice tech, mass personalization, machine co-creativity, AI, and AI as a service. Um, and then, you know, some of the nefarious ones that are out there, notably deep fake, uh, both uh, visual and audio. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot uh, to, to cover here. Uh, but I, I think, you know, maybe it makes sense to start from a, a broader place. Uh, yeah, I remember when all of this technology was relatively new and I would talk to communicators about a new technology that held great promise for communication. And they would say, no, 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 look, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, YouTube, that's, that's all I have bandwidth for. Um, how do you manage 
existing and new technologies in a strategic way that doesn't overload you? Well, overload us individually or us as an organization? Because I think that's uh, what I would I say us as a profession. As a profession. Well, and there I think uh, part of it is you have to have this innate curiosity to go out and sort of study and read and play with and want to be amongst the first on the user side of things just to get a feel for things, to see if there is a logical application of something within an organization that we could actually bring. And I think it's up to us in some ways to be the counterpoint for the people in IT who sometimes want to rush new technologies out. Sometimes they want to drag their heels to rush it out, but sort of from a technology standpoint, what's possible, but then from a user standpoint, we represent a very, very important constituency which is employees slash and you know go from that audience on out. Uh, Barry, you were going to say something. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking back to the results of of the survey that we did um, in in March of 2020, and what you saw uh, for the people. This particular survey really focused on people who had adopted uh, technology. And the majority of them really filled that with the early adopter profile, not an innovator profile, an early adopter profile. And it's important to recognize that because the early adopter has social status within the organization. They have access to funding. And that's very different than the individual worker who might be sitting in, in, you know, in front of their screen and, you know, testing something, right? Um, and so I think in a way, like you, you mentioned, Shell, you know, some of this technology, I mean, it's been out there a while, you know, it, it's on simmer, you know, it's already cooked and it's just on simmer. And so what we really see is, and, and interestingly, the one motivating factor for where do you put your focus was not on saving time, money, all those, all, all the hoopla we always think it's going to be in an organization. It was on improving the quality of work coming out of a communication area. So I think that gives a little bit of insight as to how um, people who are actually in the throes of doing this have approached it in, in the most recent years. You know, one of the things that I have found, you know, from the perspective of a, a college that had to, uh, within a week, go remote, uh, the things that helped us adopt new technologies, both from the teaching side and the administrative side, was our ability to find technologies that played well together and that integrated across platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think the most frustrating thing for users is when they have to learn some completely new interface and logons and protocols for all these different kinds of technologies. And uh, to the extent that platforms are now integrating other technologies and speak to one another and share data, I think it becomes easier to adapt and adopt, and it's less of a drag on workflow. One of the things that I often worry about with new technologies um, is that they're actually an impediment to performance. We think they're going to help employees or help sales or help customer engagement, and actually they don't because they they involve so much overhead just to learn it and get it get it up and running in your on your system. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, with what you've all said, that, that Diane, I, I think in particular that issue about integration, just interesting story. I had a, a client that had six different wiki platforms, which the intention of, of the whole idea of the wiki is collaboration. Well, you can't collaborate if everybody's on half a dozen different Right. So so I think for me, it kind of comes back to shell the word strategy in your question. We really have to understand the users, the, the actual 
people who we expect to use the technology, we have to understand what their needs are and what their challenges are. I work with a lot of organizations who have people in remote situations where they have very limited connectivity um, and they might have limited skill set. So we, we have to understand what is it that we actually want, in my case, the employee to, to get out of the technology deployment and pick the things that are going to meet those needs first and foremost in a smooth and, and um, integrated way to, to Diane's point again. Yeah, I've been you bring that up too, Stacey, because I think the other one, I mean, there's there's sort of that chasing the shiny, bright, cool new object that uh, all of us get enamored with and we want to jump on that platform as soon as we can and introduce it. But there's also something that you brought up was this notion of um, is there sort of a one size fits all that really serves all needs? And maybe if the organization, I keep going, if the organization is small enough, you might be able to introduce something and have everyone adopt it and everybody use it. But if you do have diverse audiences with different technology needs and at different stages, maybe we need to have different tools for different groups. And, and maybe that gets back to the, is there a way that these things can be integrated? Let's keep our fingers crossed. As they say in tech sometimes, you know, the nice thing about standards is that there are like so many to choose from. <laughs> Well, and so that that is the the challenge, right, Brad? That if, if you if if your goal is for people to collaborate across group, mm -hmm. right? Then you can't have the groups working in different technologies. It, it so you have to understand what the the strategic goal is. But it takes a little bit of time sometimes. The first fax machines only talk to fax machines made by the same manufacturer. You know, wouldn't it be a shame if our cell phones only talked to people who had similar models? You know, at some point, some of these disparate platforms are going to start merging. And it doesn't really matter whether you log into this using your favorite one or the one that the, the company standard. There'll be a way that technology will find this out. One of the things that I read that I just loved is in terms of a comment was, COVID by forcing us all to work from home and work remotely is gonna teach some of the technology people who are coming up with these great new toys and tools and technologies to come up with even better ways to work from home. And that innovation, because they're being forced to use it every day, will spur some uh, sort of advances in the kinds of technologies and the user friendliness that uh, I think all of us sort of need slash hope for. Because most of us don't have IT as the background, we've had to, uh, learn to be that bridge between our audiences and the IT world that wants to roll out all sorts of great new cool tools. Yeah, there's this concept called multi-experience uh, that I mm -hmm. have been reading about. Uh, Domino's Pizza uh, is a great adopter of this. If you want to order a pizza through a device, you can do it through Slack, you can do it through Teams, you can do it through your Alexa or your Google device, you, your Google Assistant, through your TV. Uh, it all works pretty much the same way, but you don't have to go down the path of uh, installing a, a, an app you don't want to use when you have devices that are already per perfectly capable of uh, accomplishing that task for you. So you know, that's one of the things I think that organizations need to look at. Since people are using different tools and different platforms, you should be able to access uh, the organization services through whichever one you want. Uh, I think that's probably more applicable for external communications and marketing than necessarily internal communication, but uh, it's it's getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. So um, let's talk about some technologies and then we'll jump back into some of the, the strategies for making sure that they work. Um, what have you, uh, and Mary, I, I, I am very interested in the latest results uh, from your artificial intelligence research. AI is uh, clearly uh, going to be one of the dominant technologies that we're going to be using, even if it's just on the back end of something like uh, a chatbot. Yeah, and what we really um, wanted to focus on was what are they adopting right now? And what was the motivator behind that? And so the top things that they were really looking at really felt a little bit more in tools that had to do with analytics 
So like web analytics, um, because they got the biggest hit out of those type of things. And so obviously you think of that and, and Google analytics came up as, as one of the um, top things that they were asking employees to adopt. In fact, a lot of those were connected to like the certification that you can get in Google Analytics. So um, that's become a nice compliment, I know, even for my grad students at Loyola. You know, as they were looking and saying, what are some things we, we should be doing uh, now that, that we're virtually, you know, synchronous and asynchronous? And what we said is work on certifications. And one of the top certifications that they are looking, and, and it's pretty easy to get. You just have to put in the time. But the other thing that Compros were looking at in terms of tools were those tools that help frame messages. So when we talk about framing a message, we're looking at you know the, the word choice, right? The tone of the message. We're looking at the visuals that accompany a message. And so there again, they were looking and saying, where's that tool that kind of could help me with framing that is integrated? Like I'm going to use this for the visual. I'm going to use this, you know, for uh, word choice or tone. And so obviously one of the top ones that was being used at, at a unit level was Grammarly and Grammarly business because, you know, they certainly give you that flexibility to identify the tone and, and kind of uh, the business speak. Or am I just trying to persuade? Am I trying to inform? Um, and then the last area that um, they were looking at was content creation. And, and that involved a lot of the collaboration tools. And so, you know, putting content out there and then saying, oh, it has to go through some sort of an approval route. And so who's going to look at that and how can they provide their input in an efficient manner? So those were the top areas that tools were being used. And, you know, some of them, um, you know, Google always keeps coming up when you're talking about content creation and the ability of people to move in and out of Google fairly easily. So those were the things that they were mostly focused on. Okay, let's talk about that in a minute, but first we have a comment from uh, the audience. John Brown says that Microsoft Teams is supporting no-code and low-code apps uh, to integrate task functions. Uh, yeah, and I think this goes back, Brad, to, to what you were saying uh, about um, the pandemic leading the developers of these tools to find easier and easier ways for us to take advantage of them in this, you know, forced upon us remote work situation. Yeah, in fact, Mike Klein, who many of you know, an IABC guru out there, has said that the new platform is the headquarters. Uh, it used to be a bricks and mortar kind of thing where everybody went. Well, now it's the platform that you use to get everybody together to be able to collaborate, to be able to accomplish goals, to be able to inform, to be able to communicate. And so um, in some ways, uh, we're being sort of encouraged to do all of this stuff a little bit sooner. Mary, the prospect of uh, having to run things through a, uh, an approval process that includes artificial intelligence scares me a little bit. I'm not sure that I trust the lawyers as it is. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. The legal department adds value. Let's see what value um, she who shall not be named, who if I say her name, the speaker will go bing bong in the corner. So. <laughs> well, it's interesting to... Sorry, go ahead, Diane. Um, you know, you're talking about content creation, Mary, and uh, one of the things that uh, we were starting to look at in journalism is AI to be able to do parts of investigative reporting so that more local news is sustainable. Uh, so there's some interesting work being done and funded uh, in the journalism realm to do things like scraping of data uh, and then uh, doing analysis of it. Uh, such that uh, a reporter 
is then left to do what a human being can do, which is to put the human angle on it and to make a story out of it. Um, but I think there are some of those technologies that will be useful for us in corporate communications. Um, some of that is based on, of course, having the standards of data out there in databases that can be accessible. Uh, but part of it also is that it's manipulated by the end user. So um, mm -hmm. let's say that I'm in Tompkins County, New York, and I'm interested in what's happening in the real estate market. Uh, instead of having to depend on a reporter doing a story on it, which they may never get to, um, I may be able to engage with a newspaper's bot that scrapes data and allows me to form somewhat of a story myself. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if AI and this kind of content creation uh, gets into corporate communications and especially allows employees to get an angle on stories that they can ask for and interpret themselves. Yeah, I uh, have read uh, for years now about AI being used to produce um, high school sports stories. Uh, the data is being uploaded somewhere, but there is no news organization that has the resources to send a reporter to every high school football game. But you feed the AI the information, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of football stories about the, the results of a game. Uh, and then you give it the stats from a particular game and it can create its own article. I, I know it's also being used to produce uh, corporate earnings stories based on the press releases that are being released from uh, organizations. So yeah, obviously, I think there's going to be more opportunity for AI to produce content of that kind that, let's face it, is busy work for communicators, leaving them free to do more strategic or at least more featurey type content. But I, well, I think, um, Shell, we have to we have to be really careful about where we're using AI um, when it comes to content creation specifically. And I'll give you an example of that. Last week, I presented a, a session for the IBC Southern Region Conference, uh, which was all virtual. And um, what I was presenting about is some work that I've done with, with several different clients, leveraging country culture research to tailor messages for employees in different countries. Um, and so the, this is really looking at differences like masculine versus feminine culture, uh, individual versus collective, and using those differences to reframe messages for employees so that they are able to, to not just comprehend but act on those messages in a, in a way that we want them to. And that's not something that AI can do yet. Um, so I, I think we need to keep in mind where are the appropriate places, certainly with like high school sports, you know, that, that makes sense. But for me on the employee side of things, I think there's some nuances there that I would not feel comfortable allowing AI to control. But I think the other piece, though, that goes along with that, Stacey, is the technology is going to change. And right now, there are people who are writing the algorithms behind that, uh, sort of like translating what it is that the desired outcome is in terms of the output into rules that can be followed by some machine somewhere. So um, in the example you gave, Shell, of an earnings report, it can go and look at numbers. And if it's between this range and this range, you use these sorts of words to fill in the gap. Um, I think we have um, a challenge ahead of us. I think AI can be the tool to be able to help us get there sometime in the future of being able to tailor messages to the audience as you're talking about, Stacey, because one of the things that I think we have to do at some point is move from what I've called for a long time a sender-centric viewpoint of the uh, communications world to a receiver-centric viewpoint. And to get there means tailoring things to the individual's who are receiving things as opposed to those of us who are, have been sort of deemed to be the demigods of communications and decide what it is that people should read and how they're going to read it. If we have to start doing this for the audiences of one all over the globe, we're going to be hard pressed to accomplish that. We just don't have the bandwidth to be able to do it. So I think we're going to have to use tools and technologies 
to be able to achieve that goal of making the information timely, relevant, and everything else to various audiences and move away from the model that we followed for a very long time, which was the one size fits all, thou shalt read this, thou shalt watch it, and thou will you know, know everything that one needs to know. We're not gonna be in that world very much longer. And I agree, Brad, you, we, we can't do the, the one size fits all, um, but I, I think we just have to be smart about how we go about doing that um, and ask ourselves questions like, can the technology right now for, for this moment in time um, address all of those nuances that, that need to happen? Yeah, one of the things I'd like to use AI for on my job uh, is to write the new hire profile, uh, mm -hmm. because the, the new hires fill out a form and it's background information, but we also ask some fun questions. What's your favorite hobby? What's your favorite food? Things like that. And we've published, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these over the years. We could train an AI to crank this stuff out so that you know, we don't have to spend the time doing it. We could certainly edit it before it goes online to make sure nothing wrong has been published. What One other thing that AI can do, and um, I want to pull this up here from my screen. Uh, this is a website called uh, This Person Does Not Exist. Uh, these are uh, images of people that have been created by artificial intelligence. Uh, these are not real people, but you really couldn't tell from looking at them. So you know, these can be used for good and they can be used for evil. Yeah. They're all white males, so it's probably- So, so far, yeah, I think that's coincidence because I have definitely scrolled, you know, refreshed okay. and gotten others. But, um, you know, deep fakes from artificial intelligence are, are, are certainly a concern. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can also see them being used uh, very effectively. For example, uh, the idea that you could have your CEO um, deliver the same speech that he just delivered in English, being the only language that he knows, uh, deliver it in Portuguese and French and, and Spanish for the employee populations uh, using deepfake to just have somebody else say it and, and have it come out of the CEO's mouth uh, much better than having people sit and read a transcript that's been translated. So there's definitely applications that we can consider and, for that. And everybody's already using stock photos of people that are almost as unreal as the ones we just saw. I mean, I'm waiting for the time when we actually start using employee photos in a lot of our communications to go with things so that it becomes a little bit more on the real. I mean, I think we've, we can't lose touch of the human touch. Yep. Video is another technology. It's certainly not a, a new technology, but it remains a hot technology. Uh, one of the trends in video, uh, actually there are two trends in video that are diametrically opposed. One is long form video. We're seeing mm -hmm. some organizations start to produce feature length documentaries uh, that are actually some of them quite good. Uh, the other trend is that they're getting shorter and shorter. Uh, if, if you watch sports, uh, seeing a, a, a video ad that uh, fills the time uh, while the referees are in a huddle trying to determine what the call is, maybe 10 seconds. Um, how do you continue to capture the attention of your audience with videos that have so little space, uh, so little time to get a message across? And by the way, TikTok uh, would be another example of that. Uh, there are brands that are doing extraordinary things in TikTok, but you don't have a lot of time to, to get your message across. Yeah. That's a huge, huge challenge. Yeah, and I think it, you know, because we work with a, a global tech company and we work with, um, because we tend to be more in the marketing and Marcom side, you know, we do a lot of, we work with their channel partners. So we work through them with other companies. And these companies are probably more like middle market companies, so they're not the large global corporate. But one of the things that, you know, we we really have spent in, in the five years that we've done this, we really have focused on that stakeholder analysis. 
And, and for instance, you know, one client was in, um, you know, the Southwest and the other states that they went into, you know, they were trying to train their sales um, team in a, like, who are you talking to? And so it, it was the sense of, you know, in, in marketing, of course, we have used personas forever, right? And we're using those in com now, especially Stratcom. And, you know, but one of the things was, can we now with technology actually get these personas of who a sales um, uh, account exec might encounter on a sales call and can we you know create them you know somewhat animated right and, and make them move right make them alive and i think that that um that then uh, a, a big thing that you know realizing for instance as as these companies go into different states we change the persona for who they're talking to in that state and you know the type of industry and everything else so i i can see where you know you you have the the faces up there of people that are being created those personas but also joining them and and making them come alive i think that 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 is quite a powerful combination and so oh. if if i could add to to what mary has said um in addition, I think we need to uh, really zero in on the most important message. Uh, and this has to do with the, the just content continuing to get shorter, you know, the, the videos like that you mentioned TikTok. And so I have a teenager. So she's bringing me, look at this video, mom. Like, and, and they are all very short. So it forces us to really nail down what's the one most important thing uh, when it comes to delivering very brief video pieces for the employee stakeholders, uh, we, we really have that one specific thing that we can deliver uh, and not try to, to cover half a dozen different things. You just don't have the time. The other thing that we have found when it comes to employee video is they really like to see images of other employees. So they, they like to hear and learn from other employees. So whenever we can engage employee ambassadors to do the, the video uh, pieces, that, that really seems to work very well. Yeah, I was, I was visiting one of our subcontractors and uh, they were showing us a video library. They have a program where any employee can shoot a video with their phone about how to do something better uh, and upload it. Uh, the executive team votes every week on the best one and they get a gift card or something. But they have about 350, or at least they did when I was visiting, 350 videos. Some were just talking heads. Some were just showing the process. Some were pretty elaborate. People got very into producing these videos. Uh, but they get thousands of views from inside the organization. So it's peer-to-peer micro-training uh, of a mm -hmm. sort, taking advantage of that mobile video technology. Uh, hey. Mary, uh, we have a question uh, for you uh, that mm -hmm. has come in through Twitter. This is from our friend Robert Holland, uh, who used to be an IABC executive board member, uh, asking Mary if you could talk more about tools for framing, not familiar with it. How does it work? Hmm. So framing messages, ooh, I'm trying to think how long it's kind of been out there, quite some time. Um, and framing messages involves how do we choose to put that message together? So do are we going to use statistics? Are we going to use an analogy? Are we using visual? There is um, an actual framing institute um, and I don't have the exact web address right now, but um, I believe that there are 12 elements of framing and, you know, which ones are, are you, can you use that will resonate with your target or, or what we would say in calm is your key stakeholder group that you're isolating. So 
you use all of these different framing elements to do this. And, and one of them is obviously visual. One of them is um, you have what type of evidence is supporting that message. Um, but back to what Stacy was saying, it really is that focus of, of uh, a very targeted message that is designed specifically for that key stakeholder that you're talking to. But if if you want to chat about that or, or anything else, I'm happy to do that offline. No problem, Robert. Let's let's jump into uh, another technology uh, that is heating up right now, and that's virtual reality. Uh, Oculus has released the Quest Two. Sales are um, just blowing away the sales of the the first Quest. I have one of each, actually. Uh, I use mine mainly for exercise. Uh, I've got a six foot space in the garage. Uh, and I have a boxing program and uh, a dance program and a racquetball program, and uh, I don't need to go to a gym. It's it's a pretty solid workout. But there are definitely niche applications uh, for VR in the workplace. What what are you seeing? How are organizations taking advantage of, of virtual reality? I see it a lot on the training side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think uh, especially to be able to put people into environments that are uh, possibly dangerous or difficult to get to, um, these kind of immersive environments and allowing people to practice, allowing people to see what happens if you choose different approaches. Um, it's, it's still not widely uh, adopted. Um, it has been used in the military, of course, for a very long time for obvious reasons. Um, both because of the standardization of training that's necessary and, and some of the dangerous uh, content. Uh, but I think that it, it is going to be more widely adopted. We're seeing it being used uh, more in higher ed, uh, especially now with the lockdown and um, trying to allow students to be able to simulate things that otherwise are only done in a hands-on lab. Um, there's there's going to be an incredible amount of learning that happens there, tools that are developed, and I think even more so people's expectations and, and uh, level of comfort with that technology. So I think we're going to see things change uh, in a in a big leap very quickly with uh, with AR and VR. Well, it's interesting too. I think Diane, that we're living in a two-dimensional world. Um, you know, we're sort of forced by the screen to behave in two dimensions. When at some point, and AR and VR certainly get us toward that three-dimensional world. There was a demo done a number of years ago uh, when I was at Cisco with um, three-dimensional holographic telepresence. So instead of um, you know, being a screen of some sort, you could actually project a person life size in real time somewhere. So think um, of Princess Leia in Star Wars with, you know, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope, projected this big, only projected life size where you can interact. So right now, I think we've been, in a sense, limited by the technology that surrounds all of us, whether it's something we carry in our pocket or this. We're going to start seeing some amazing things that are going to happen when we start to think three dimensions and sort of beyond the, the flat plasma thing that's in front of us. Yeah, one of the apps that I have experimented with on the Quest is called Spatial. Uh, and it takes a, a photo of your face and, and then puts you in, in, right. on a body in a 3D space where you can not only engage with other people, but you can create objects. So for example, I work in the construction industry we could actually have a, a, a model of the building. Uh, they're being created through a process called BIM anyway. Uh, so to convert it to the format for this, you could have a group of people from all over the world in a conference room manipulating this model um, in real time. And you could explode it larger so you can walk inside. Uh, you can br make it fit on the tabletop so you can look at the, uh, the skin of the building and, and things like that. But uh, uh, pretty remarkable. I've been in one meeting that Spatial, the company behind it, put on with about 40 people in the room. Um, and it felt like I was in a room. Yeah. <laughs> it was remarkable. Yeah. It wasn't 
avatar cartoony people like you see in some of these apps. This was you and other real people. Uh, another use I've seen is new hire orientation so that you can maybe visit other facilities in the organization. Uh, and, and certainly for live broadcasting, if there's a, a, say a town hall being held for the organization, somebody who uh, rather than sit in front of the computer, they could actually be sitting in a seat with people beside them watching the presentation live. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about the potential for virtual reality. And I think the other area, and I've seen a, a bit of this, is on regulatory and compliance side. You know, because a lot of times in reg and compliance, you're depicting scenarios that a lot of people have, are not familiar with. Right? They don't come in contact with, with those types of scenarios, but they need to understand them. And they're using a little of, of virtual reality, you know, the... the companies that put together the training for regulatory and compliance and um, Diane had mentioned. Yeah, one other thing that I've, I understand about virtual reality is that it creates empathy in a way that other forms of communication yeah. do not. Uh, so for training managers to do one-on-ones with their direct reports, for example, or how do you uh, lay somebody off uh, some of these things to really learn that empathy that you can then translate to the real world. Yeah, um, I do uh, add a, a, an, another example of a place where I think it, it could be really useful, and that is in the healthcare industry, is uh, to help employees understand protocol issues um, because they obviously right now have volumes and volumes of content around protocol. Um, if we had the ability to, to kind of help them step into the environment and experience the protocol in a different way, um, it, it might help with learning and, and retention. Yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark Schaefer is uh, a, a marketing advisor uh, who has coined the term content crash. Uh, he believes that there is so much content out there now uh, in so many different formats that your ability to capture any share of attention is gone. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, with all of these new tools, uh, and we, we still haven't talked about several of them that I, I wanted to, um, how do you make sure that you're getting your message to uh, the people you want to get it to? I, I think that's a really good question. And I think, first of all, you have to step back and try to see what the volume of communication is out there. Uh, I remember uh, more than a decade ago, I was doing a consulting project for a large Canadian bank and they were bemoaning the fact that nobody was watching the videos that they were sending out to the branches and the newsletters and the this and the that. And as I went around and talked to more people, I got more examples of things that they were sending out. And uh, so I came up with the idea of to make me a branch and send me everything for a month that a branch manager gets. And we sat down and culled through it all, and we figured out that if a branch manager had, in fact, read everything and watched all the videos that was sent to him or her in a month, there would be no time left to do any other work. So, um, you know, I think it is uh, an enormous question about the overload that we are piling on people that's actually decreasing their performance, not increasing their performance. Uh, Shell, you mentioned the concept of microlearning. I think we have to take a leaf out of the book of training that is at least trying to approach it by only giving the amount of information, the content, and, and, uh, and when and where it is absolutely needed and can be applied. And so if we as communicators can figure out uh, using intelligent technologies or allowing uh, the end uh, user to be able to call up things when and where they need it very short, then maybe we are, in fact, impacting performance in a positive way. Well, I think that sort of ties in with another one. You know, in addition, Shell, to be able to invent the product you've already come up with, I think another one that I would love to see some brilliant communications people come up with is this box, a box into which you dump content 
of all sorts, whether it's photos, you know, images, graphs, charts, data, um, stories, headlines, leads, and the machine will sort of parse this stuff out to those who want to subscribe to things based upon keywords and sort of send out what it is that people need to do their jobs better. And what I find is that um, we still come at this from the mass media approach to communication as opposed to the individual. And we're trying to use, in a sense, large scale tools to be able to reach individuals. And we need to figure ways to, to flip that on its head. One thing that I think we also need to become sort of comfortable with and embracing, and we even hit upon it when we were talking about some of these examples, are pilots, different things for different parts of the organizations at different stages of rolling out to find out their applicability, find out whether or not it needs to be used. And just because two people have the same jobs and they're sitting side by side or they're miles apart, doesn't necessarily mean that their information needs are going to be exactly the same. So we need to find ways to be able to flip that around and let others decide what it is that they want. And some of this question of the, how are we gonna not overload people? They're gonna to have to be the ones who determine what overload is, and we're not the ones who decide that. There are some early tools that are trying to do that. I'm thinking of the, uh, the social choruses and the dynamic signals of the world for internal comms. They're trying to produce a consumer grade app that allows employees to subscribe to channels that are relevant to them. So what they get in their main feed is what they've subscribed to. You can also push out things that maybe people would never subscribe to, but need to know, like the deadline for enrolling for your benefits. Uh, I don't know how many people would actually subscribe to a benefits channel, but they do need to know that. Uh, and then the back end of this not only works with the mobile app, but it works with your intranet, it works with your digital signage, it works with your email, uh, and you can make sure that it is uh, being presented in the several places that it needs to be seen. Um, is, is that getting close to, to what you're talking about? It also, by the way, uh, empowers employee-generated content. Uh, I was talking to uh, the internal communicator from Dow a couple of years ago. They were using Social Chorus and had over 300 channels. Uh, there was one for employees who spoke Portuguese. There was one just for uh, the, the charitable cause that the organization was involved with. Uh, and I've, there's no company with enough communicators to populate 300 channels of content. Um, you know, my view at, at my organization was, well, this is great. We could have a channel just for project engineers and they would communicate with each other, sharing great content and photos and, and videos and what have you. D does that get close to, to what you're suggesting, Brad? I, I think so. I think one of the things that we need to uh, become comfortable with is that we're not necessarily responsible for all the communications that takes place within an organization. What we need to do is help create the communications environment. And some of that means the tools and the technologies and maybe some of the content, but we need to uh, find ways, just like we wouldn't want to manage every email message that goes back and forth or every telephone conversation, we need to get comfortable with the idea that others are sharing information and maybe we don't have to play a role in making some of that happen. But uh, that, that's downstream. Well, I'm actually, I, I would say, though, Brad, that that's not entirely downstream. I mean, this is something that, that we've been um, educating clients on for almost 10 years now is to, to the communicators to let go of that responsibility for content creation and identify ways for others in the organization to create it and share it. And I've, I've got clients that have people all over the organization who are sharing content. In some cases, it's very targeted sharing, uh, like Shal was suggesting. You have a, a particular group of people who maybe work in, in kind of similar functions around the globe, but, but didn't previously connect, and now they're able to, to share. Um, we don't even curate that. Um, but in other cases, we might curate some of the content so that we can capture really valuable things that we want to share with the rest of the organization. But this is stuff that's been going on for a while. Um, and I, I, I really encourage my clients to let go of that responsibility for 
creating and, and managing and curating all of the content because there are opportunities now for others in the organization to do a lot of that creation and sharing. Uh, one of the challenges that we face with technology, both internally and externally, is that there are people who don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, internally, this is usually people uh, on the manufacturing floor or in the field. Uh, again, I work in construction, so the laborers out uh, working on the building, uh, they don't have email addresses for the company. Um, for example, I mean, they're union workers, so they belong to the union. Uh, which handles a lot of the communication with them, but it keeps us from being able to reach them from the corporate level. Certainly their superintendents can talk to them all they want. Uh, externally, we're certainly seeing this with the pandemic, with uh, the move toward uh, school being remote and uh, families that just don't have the, the, the hardware or necessarily the connectivity uh, for their kids to participate in this. Um, how should communicators be thinking about addressing that to make sure these people aren't left out? You know, and I can tell you what, what we kind of did from, uh, you know, a technology standpoint was to make available the hotspots, right? The, the little hockey puck, right? And um, for certain individuals. And so it, uh, you know, you could request a hotspot and then, you know, you, you would have this access and it's, um, you know, it's easy for you to um, join a network or something like that. But I think, you know, interestingly, you know, I, I have uh, grandchildren. I know I don't look at all, but I do have grandchildren. And, um, you know, it's interesting because with, you know, the, the, school going virtual, you know, it's, you also have to have multiple laptops. So you now have to have a child who's in kindergarten and a child who's in first grade, second grade, they all have to have their own laptop. So there's still, even outside of access to the network, you know, there's, there's so many levels of access that, that we have to um, kind of keep drilling down in order to, to kind of make it happen. And um, and I think that's where you're seeing so much now in terms of anytime you're you're providing feedback on something, it was you know accessibility, and you provide a rating on the accessibility to something that that you're viewing. But there's so many. It's almost like accessibility. You think it's this one thing, but it's a peeling back of the onion almost that has to take place to say. Well, is it just access to a network? Oh no, it's access to a device. It's that oh now it's access to this type of a device and how those those are being done. Diane had mentioned some of these, these micro tools that we use, and, and I know I've I've used a couple of them that come out of uh, Harvard in education and really neat tools. I wish that they were accessible via a laptop. They're accessible only via, uh, via uh, you know, a phone. And so you're kind of like, well, does that assume people are sitting on a train, but they're not really going into the office anymore. And so it, it seems even some of the ways that some of these things have been designed already need to kind of look through a different lens in this day and age. Yeah, we're, we're kind of at their mercy. I was hoping yeah. that uh, the uh, Google Assistant would be able to alert me whenever I got an email from a particular organization, and, and it can't, even though I'm using Gmail. And I'm, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> you know? So, but uh, you know, I think one of the other options that we need to keep in mind, and I think this is definitely more appropriate for internal than external communication, is the fact that we are using these great technologies doesn't mean we should abandon the old ones. Uh, print yes. is still an effective technology. I was back in my independent days working with a, a very large, well-known hospital on the East Coast. Uh, they were very advanced in the ways they communicated with employees, but nurses couldn't take advantage of it because they needed to be with patients. They couldn't be on their computer or on their phone. They were also a union uh, hospital, which means that if they were pulling it up on their phone on their own time, they needed to be paid for it contractually. 
so what they did was they printed a daily nurses bulletin and put them in bins where nurses could grab them on their way out and uh, they sold out every day and nobody ever complained that they weren't being paid for reading the paper newsletter on the bus on the way home. Yeah. And the th thing I would add, Shell, um, is understanding the, the stakeholder group. So we we make assumptions sometimes about what a particular group of stakeholders can or cannot do, whether it has to do with their time while they're on the job or their the situation they're in, or the skill set that they may or may not have. And we need to stop making those assumptions and do the necessary research to understand what are the challenges for a particular group of stakeholders so that we can deliver to them in the right way, whether it be paper or leader-driven communication, which continues to be very important in certain organizations with certain employee groups. Um, or, you know, are there different methods? Are there some that actually the phone is is the better option for? Um, because they don't have a laptop, they don't they don't have even maybe a tablet. So we have to do that research and understand. And I'll you know I'll give you an example. We were doing research for um, a mining company, and they had long made the assumption that the folks who work in the pit didn't have technology skills. And in fact, what we found is that they're quite savvy with their smartphones. They all have a smartphone. They just can't have them with them in the pit. But as soon as they leave that safe zone, they um, are on their smartphones and they're using the technology very effectively. So it changed our understanding about what we could deliver and how best to do it. We have about... Uh three minutes, three and a half minutes left. I'd like to go around the horn uh, and hear from each of you what sources you use to stay up to, up to speed on the technologies that are emerging and uh, their potential applicability to your organizations or clients. Uh, and we'll go in reverse order from the way I introduced you. So Brad, what would, how well, do you stay in touch? I was try and follow what it is that Shell Holtz is doing, because I know that I will be in his wake no matter what happens. Um, another thing, though, that I think is very, very important, um, you know, at, historically at IABC World Conference, just wandering through the booth and seeing who's there displaying what sort of cool technologies, going to the sessions where they're showcasing that. Even this last year when uh, IABC's World Conference was virtual, attending and going to sessions that dealt with technology providers um, was critical because you get to see the demos, you start to think through the applicability, you start to hear the, the use cases that different organizations are putting this technology to work for. So mine is you know, to sort of tap that network that's out there and follow what the leaders are doing. Great, Mary? Well, I can tell you that um, the people who are adopting technology they say they would love to have the industry and the association actually keep them up to speed on things. But what they actually use is when they um, want to learn about something, they jump on you know, the web and they do a little background. They try to isolate two or three vendors who provide um, a product in that. And they simply call them in and they talk to them. Um, and then, interestingly, Diane, they um, follow that up with going to academia to see what academia is saying about things. And so it's a, it's a regular process. Great. Stacy, how do you stay up to speed? So I definitely would, would uh, echo and agree with what Brad said as far as tapping the network, um, doing, I'm um, doing speaking engagements. In COVID, it's a little different, obviously. Uh, Pre-COVID, it gave me an opportunity to um, engage with the technology vendors who were involved with the event, so that was great. But one that I'll add uh, that I think really helps me a lot, and that is having a teenager in the house. <laughs> uh, I, and also a, a young adult, a young 20s, um, child who's in college. So I, I definitely watch and observe what they are using, how they're using those tools, um, frustrations that they might be having with them. And particularly with COVID, with both of them going virtual, uh, it's been very interesting to see 
even for them as, as very high skill, highly skilled technology users, the things that they're frustrated with um, that could be improved. So the, they're, they've been a, a real great source for me. Great, and Diane. Yeah, um, you know, being in touch with college students is great, watching what they do and how they do it. I try to look at related industries. So, you know, I mentioned before, looking at what journalists are doing, looking at broadcasters, marketing, uh, corporate training, higher ed, some of the platforms that are being used in, uh, in virtual learning. I find that uh, often those can be repurposed or give me some insight into what we can do in employee and external communication. Great. And I would recommend everybody look at a service called Smart Brief and subscribe to those free email newsletters uh, is one of the ways that I stay on top of this. We are uh, past our time and I actually have a, uh, a meeting I need to be at at the top of the hour. So let me just uh, let everyone know that on December 17th, episode 64 of uh, Circle of Fellows will feature the, um, the panel of Mary, you'll be back. Uh, for that one, along with Ned Lundquist, uh, Leticia Narvez, and Mark Schumann, talking about com the communication professional's role in creating and sustaining a leading corporate environment. There's a broad topic. Yeah. Uh, and I do want to thank the panel for your time and your insights today, as well as to thank Anna Willey, for, uh, as always, for her behind-the-scenes management of this whole process. Um, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you all next month. Bye-bye. Uh, be safe.